Let's turn to our study outline and your program, and as you're turning, let me welcome those of you that are joining us online, as well as our friends in Arco, Idaho at the Baptist Community Church and Purpose Church in Kalispell, Montana. We are so very glad that you're joining us for our study of God's Word. We've been doing a series on the final seven words of Jesus on the cross, and it's been called Last Words. And I have just loved this series, and I hope you have enjoyed it as well. I mean, just seven brief but powerful words. I mean, the words of Jesus on the cross, they're so so short, but they have like this incredible meaning uh, behind them. Um, Mark Adams writes, on March 8th, 1841, William Henry Harrison, the ninth president of the United States, delivered the longest inaugural speech on record. Um, He was a a Virginian, um, like more presidents were Virginians than any other state. I just thought I would slip that in there, okay? So he's a Virginian, but he was a long-winded Virginian. How many of you have ever been impacted by a long-winded Virginian? How many many of you have ever known a long-winded Virginian? Now, in spite of the fact that it was raining and freezing cold, he refused to shorten his message, his address, his inaugural address. So he spoke for two hours in the rain and cold. As a result of that, he got pneumonia and died one month later on April 4th. Uh, You could accurately say, uh, Mark Adams writes, you could accurately say that no president has ever said more and done less uh, than William Henry Harrison. Now, compare that to Jesus on the cross. Uh, Compare that to Jesus on the cross. No man has ever said less and done more than the seven final words of Jesus on the cross. Today we come to the sixth word, which is the word of victory. We'll do the seventh word at Good Friday service. Today we do the sixth word, the word of victory. John 19, verse 29, a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Now, we all struggle with finishing things. I, I, boy, I know I do. Ray Pritchard writes, how many times have we started to read a book and not finished it? How many of you have ever started to read a book and you didn't finish it? Uh, man, my, my poor wife, Kimberly, we have little piles of books around our bedroom that I have started that I haven't finished. And she says, get, get rid of the books. I'm like, oh, I'm going to finish it. Someday, someday, I always dream that I could be in a low security prison sometime and just uh, <laughs> catch up on all my reading. Uh, nothing too rough, but just low security. Um, uh, how about the letter we started but never sent? Uh, how, about, how about the abandoned diet, um, the unfinished degree, the phone calls we've never returned? But then there are some more serious things we haven't finished, the, the unfinished marriage or the bills we aren't able to pay or the promises we haven't kept. Uh, we all go through life leaving behind a trail of unfinished projects and unfulfilled dreams Um, how uh, few people there are that come to the end of their lives and are able to say, I finished exactly what I set out to do. Uh, How many of you have ever been to Mount Rushmore? How many of you have ever been to Mount Rushmore? Well, here's a little known fact about the sculptor who did Mount Rushmore, a man named Gutzon Borglum. He never finished it. He spent way more time on George Washington than the other three because George Washington was, after all, a Virginian. As a matter of fact, half of them are Virginians on there, if I just thought I'd point that out. Uh, But he spent way more time on George Washington. He originally uh, planned to extend each of the presidents down into the chest area. See how Washington, it goes down to the chest, but the other three uh, didn't do that. But he didn't live long enough to finish it. His son continued his work after he died, uh, but he ran out of money. And so Mount Rushmore remains unfinished. Now, there's only one person in history who came to the end of his life, and he had no unfinished business. His name was Jesus Christ, and he was able to say, it is finished. Now, it's only three words in English, uh, but it's only one word in Greek, and here it is, tetelestai. And, uh, and, and I just want to say it, and let's just kind of repeat it three times and just be bold. I was talking to Dr. Carl Tony, who's a New Testament scholar in our church, and I was actually working on my presentation on the phone with him earlier today. And he said, Glenn, the important thing 
is just say it boldly, because nobody knows if you get it right or not. You know, just, just rip it out of there. But the closest I can say is tetelestai. Okay, so let, let's see if we're going to try. Just, just be bold, okay? Don't, don't worry about right or wrong. Just, just be bold on it. Ready? Out loud together. Tetelestai. One more time out loud. Tetelestai. One more time together. Tetelestai. It's from the Greek verb teleo, which means to bring to an end, to complete, and to accomplish. Uh, it's in the perfect tense in the Greek. Now, that's significant, what tense it's in, because the perfect tense means an action that has been completed in the past with results continuing into the present. Isn't that cool? Present tense means something's been done in the past, but the impact of it continues into the present. Now, it's different than the past tense, which means this certain thing happened. But the perfect tense adds this whole idea that this thing happened and it is still in effect today. So when Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is finished in the past, it is still finished in the present, and it will remain finished in the future. Now notice, he didn't say, I am finished, which would be a cry of defeat. He says, it is finished, which was a cry of victory. Now he said it, I believe, differently than he said last week's word, the fifth word, which is, I thirst. Remember we said last Sunday that he said, I thirst, he could barely get it out. He was so parched and raging thirst that he probably just whispered. It was almost more like a moan, I thirst. But then they gave him some wine vinegar to drink, and it, and it loosened up. It wet down his, his vocal cords so, so that then he could say in a loud voice, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, refer to Jesus saying something with a loud voice, shouting it out just before he died, Tetelestai. Uh, it was not a cry, it was a pronouncement. Uh, these are the words of a conqueror that's claiming victory. Now, what are the seven things that were finished when he said that? First of all, uh, Jesus' earthly mission was, was finished. Uh, he says in Luke 12, verse 50, but I have a baptism to undergo. Now, this is a baptism of suffering. It's not the baptism of a public commitment to Christ that we're going to do next uh, Sunday on Easter Sunday at the Fairplex. This is a baptism of suffering to undergo. And what constraint I am under until it is tetelestai, until it is completed. Uh, chapter 18 of Luke's biography of Jesus. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and told them we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be tetelestai. It'll be fulfilled. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to tetelestai, to finish his work. Uh, chapter 5, John goes on to say, for the works that the Father has given me, to tetelestai, to finish the very works that I'm doing, testify that the Father has sent me. And then John 17, verse 4, uh, Jesus says, I brought you, he's praying here, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by tetelestai, finishing the work that you gave me to do. And then we come to the cross, uh, Luke, uh, John 19, verse 30, when he received the drink, Jesus shouted, he said, tetelestai, it is is finished. Uh, I love the way the old um, King James translation puts Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I want to read it in the old King James. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and Tetelestai, the finisher of our faith. Isn't that awesome? The finisher of our faith. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says he was able to finish it because the joy that was, that was set before him. You know, sometimes why we don't finish things is because we take our eyes off, off of heaven. And I think kind of the pendulum's gone the other way. It used to be years ago, there was so much emphasis on heaven 
that the criticism of Christians was, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Because all the emphasis was on just getting ourselves to heaven. And there was no emphasis on, you know, fighting injustice, the side of heaven as Pastor Tomiko leads us in doing or, or helping people in need, you know, this side of heaven and all that. So there was a reaction against that, saying, you know what, we're so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good, let's, let's be earthly good. But now I think the pendulum has gone too far the other way. We don't talk about heaven enough. I believe you're only of earthly good when you are focused on heaven. Uh, if it was a good enough motivation for Jesus, it should be a good enough motivation for us. It says that he hung in there. I mean, sometimes other motivations just don't cut it. When you're really in the midst of some temptation or some trial or some trouble, it's not enough to just say, okay, there are the reasons that I'm going to do this. For the joy that was set before him. Sometimes in something in your life, you just got to hang in there till you get to heaven. It's not going to get better this side of heaven. You just got to hang in there with the hope of the joy that's set uh, before you. Now, speaking of heaven, you didn't think I was going to get through a whole sermon without talking about the University of Virginia winning the national championship in basketball on, on Monday night. That was just a beautiful thing. And, and the reason I was so psyched about it, being a Virginian, of course, um, was texting back to Virginia to all my old friends back there. I was all excited that night. But here's the real reason I'm so excited about it. The, the coach of University of Virginia, Tony Bennett, is just an awesome Christ follower. He, he is the real deal, baby. This guy is legit. Maybe you even heard uh, the testimony he gave at the, end of the, at the end of the game. He says, I want to give all credit to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, this guy is just, is just amazing. As a matter of fact, I had lunch with Jeff Vines, the pastor at CCV a while back, at Christ Church of the Valley. And uh, he and Tony Bennett are friends because they did evangelistic outreaches in New Zealand together uh, years ago. Well, the reason it's such a great story, if you followed it at all, is last year the University of Virginia made history, and it was not the kind of history you want to make. They were the first number one seed in the NCAA tournament in history, the first one in history, to lose to a number 16 seed. Uh, the, 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 the record of number 16 seeds until last year was 0 and 135. That is, they had lost 135 times. They had never won until the University of Virginia. And I had forgotten how bad it was. It wasn't like they lost on a buzzer beater. They lost by 20 points. They lost 72 to 52. Okay, now, okay, Tolithia knows something about this. Okay, they, they lost to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Who's ever heard of that school? Talithia has heard of that school. Okay, <laughs> UMBC. Wow. Okay, I grew up in Virginia next door, and I never heard of UMBC. So whenever Virginia went on the road all this season, all the opposing fans would mock them by chanting, UMBC, UMBC, because they had lost this thing. So, okay, how does a coach recover from that? How, does, how do you get your team up after that? And, and, and this article I read this week said he leads the team according to biblical principles. Don't you feel guilty now, Talithia? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, Virginia beat Texas Tech, which is where John and Connie Burroughs go. Only in Texas, only in Texas, uh, John and Connie Burroughs leads our choir, John leads our choir and orchestra. Um, they're both, uh, alma, their alma mater is Texas Tech. Only in Texas, guess what the slogan of Texas Tech's Red Raiders is? Guns up. <laughs> Ask Connie. Watch Connie Burroughs go guns up in front of other people. You're never going to have that slogan in California. I, I, I guarantee you. You're, ne you're never going to have that. So, so at any rate, um, where was my point here? At any rate, okay. <laughs> so he leads his team according to biblical principles. He said, one of the principles that I lead the team with is faithfulness in little things. And he says, you know what, we're going to embrace this loss. We are going to embrace the humiliation of this loss. And we're just going to remain faithful in little things. And one year later, they win their first national championship. First one in Virginia's, Virginia's history. Uh, number two, the work of redemption was finished. Tetelestai uh, was a commercial word. It was a business word in the culture of Jesus' day. In the first and second century, it meant fulfilling or paying a debt. 
So the word tetelestai in the business community of, of the early Greco-Roman world meant paid in full. It's so cool. Archaeologists have actually found receipts of bills with tetelestai written on the receipt saying paid in full. If you want to be truly biblical, when you uh, make the last payment on your car, you should shout out tetelestai. When you make the last payment on your house, you should say, Tetelestai. I think, how many of you are Dave Ramsey junkies? Let me see the Dave Ramsey junkies, okay. Talitha, you're a Dave Ramsey junkie. You know, you, you, oh, you're not a Dave Ramsey person? Oh, I thought you were. Okay, how many Dave Ramsey people we got here? Okay, okay, yeah. Well, he should make his new thing, Tetelestai. Tetelestai, that, that should be the new cry of a financial peace university. And, and that's what you should say when you pay off a debt, Tetelestai. Uh, yesterday, we had the memorial service for Dennis Endert, who had been our executive pastor, when uh, we had paid off this worship center. And there's a picture of the day we paid off and burned the mortgage. Well, if we were truly a biblical church, we should have called that a tetelestai service, not a burning of the mortgage uh, uh, service. Now, they had this cruel thing in the past, um, very unjust, called debtor's prison. And... and it was such a stupid thing, because think about it now. If you got into too much debt, they would throw you in prison. If you couldn't pay your bills when you were out of prison working, how are you going to pay off your debt when you're in debtor's prison? It just is just like so unjust, so unfair. And so the only way you'd ever get out of debtor's prison is if somebody came from the outside and paid that debt for you. And then they would list all your debts if you were in debtor prison. And if that person from the outside came and paid those debts, they would write tetelestai on their account, and then they'd be freed from debtor's prison. Now, we face the same situation with regard to our sin. We're all in debtor's prison because of our sin. Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short and we end up in debtor's prison. It says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Now, financial wages will keep you out of debtor's prison. But the wages of sin will get you into debtor's prison. But the gift of God, the outside gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He'll come as an outsider and pay off that debt so that we can be freed from debtor's prison. Now, the animal sacrifice system in Israel for the 1,400 years before Jesus was symbolic of that debt of sin being paid. Writer of Hebrews says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's the way it was symbolized, that with the shedding of the blood of the sacrificial animal, now that covered up the debt of our sin. Warren Wiersbe said this, he took my bankruptcy and covered it with his solvency. Took my bankruptcy, and he covered it with my solvency. For 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Back to the writer of Hebrews, who was writing about the Old Testament sacrificial system. He said, and by that will, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, the priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice... He's talking about us now. If you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've opened up your heart and received his forgiveness, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You know what theologians call this? And it's such a beautiful phrase. Theologians call this the finished work of Christ. Isn't that a great phrase? Anybody want to say amen to that? The finished, the finished work of Christ. Now there are three takeaways from this. Number one, once something is paid for, it is foolish to pay for it again. Uh, I mean, if you, once, if you, let's say you pay off your house someday, um, and, 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 and you make that last payment, last mortgage payment on your house, and you just say, you know what? 
even though it's paid off, I'm just going to keep sending that into the bank every month uh, after that's over. You know, I've kind of gotten in the habit. It's kind of a habit of mine, so I'm going to keep paying it. You know, you know what that is? That's just like guilt for past sins. When you continue to feel guilty for something that Christ has paid the price for, that's like paying the bank after it's been paid. It's foolish. Once it's paid for, it's done with. Tetelestai. It is finished. It's over with. Don't feel guilty about that anymore. A second takeaway. You can't add to the payment. Jesus plus nothing will save you. And yet, we just try to, we're just in the habit of feeling guilty for past stuff. We're, we're in the habit of trying to add to it. Uh, Jesus plus nothing will save you. That would be like if you say to the bank, you're, you're pay, making payments on your house, and, and you say, you know what, I'm going to give a little bit of extra. And you don't give extra just to work your principal down. Uh, the bank says, no, there won't be any benefit to you paying above and beyond the amount. You say, you know, I just want to do it. I just want to give the bank extra every month rather than what I need to. That would be foolish. And that's exactly what we try to do when we try to add stuff to what Jesus has already done to pay that debt in full. But here's the most important one of all. Uh, it doesn't do you any good. His pardon, his paying our debt to get us out of debtor's prison doesn't do any good unless you receive it. Doesn't do any good unless you receive it. Uh, Jim Burns writes, True story. There was a trial that was held in the state of Louisiana in 1982. A trial that held the attention of the entire state. A man was condemned to die for the murder of a family. As he sat on death row, his attorneys frantically tried to secure a pardon for him. They used just about every means within their grasp. But as the hour approached for his execution, all hope seemed to fade. Then unexpectedly, at 11.30 p.m., one half an hour before he was to die in the gas chamber, the governor of Louisiana extended a full pardon to the man. The attorneys were overjoyed as they brought the news to their client. As they told him of his freedom, something happened that brought the state of Louisiana to a standstill. The man refused the pardon. As a result, at precisely 12 midnight, they strapped him into the chair in the gas chamber and within a few minutes, he was dead. The entire state was in shock. The man had a full pardon, yet he chose to die anyway. Well, a fierce legal battle soon ensued over the issue. They wrestled with this legal question. Was the man pardoned because the governor offered him the pardon? Or was he pardoned only when he accepted the pardon? The highest court of the state of Louisiana was the arena for this debate. And ultimately, it was decided that a pardon cannot go into effect until it is accepted. And the exact same thing is true for us. We only get the pardon if we receive the pardon. Uh, John, who wrote a biography of Jesus, said these words. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, debt paid, pardon given, that whoever believes in him, pardon received, debt received, shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him, receives the pardon, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe, rejects the pardon, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So it's only good if we receive it. Now, today you can do that. Right here, today. Uh, what better way to start into Easter week than to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You just need to uh, pray a prayer, something like this. It can be as simple as this. Jesus, I accept you paying the debt for me. Jesus, I accept the pardon you have given to me. God, I accept that pardon because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Just that prayer will make you a member of God's family. You'll be forgiven. You'll be on your way to heaven. If you'd like to pray with somebody about that, as soon as the service is over, make a beeline right over here to the prayer room. 
And there are people in the prayer room that would just love to pray with you about this decision and just rejoice with you in that decision. And, and they would just love to do that. And I encourage you, if you have any questions about that, just to meet somebody in the prayer room and they would love to pray for you. Then number three, the power of death was finished. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, we are all in, in the grip of death, but the power of death was finished when Jesus said, Tetelestai, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, yes, we are fully confident. And we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we'll be at home with the Lord. Because of Jesus and his work on the cross, now the power of death is no longer there. And to be separated from these earthly bodies means that we are now home with the Lord. Paul wrote this way to the church at Corinth in, in the nation of Greece. He said, and the last enemy to be destroyed is, is death. Next verse, verse 2054. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And then skipping to verse 57. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Could we hold it there for just a moment? Nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. If you uh, hand one of these invitation tickets to somebody and invite them to Fairplex this week, that's never useless. If you volunteer to serve in some capacity, never useless. Useless. If you spend time praying that God is going to do a great work this week, never useless. If you even stick a lawn sign up in your yard, never useless. We saw that with the video of the Avalar family a couple of weeks ago where they just spotted a bumper sticker on somebody's car. And here this dynamic family is just totally involved in our church now just because somebody stuck a bumper sticker on their car. Never useless. Some of you have gotten so incredibly creative with these lawn signs. I've seen them in all kinds of probably illegal places. I, I've seen that. <laughs> but I want you to know I'm cool with that, all right? I'm, I'm cool with that. Fourth thing that was finished, the hatred of his enemies during his time on earth was finished. I mean, by nailing him to the cross, those people that hated Jesus, they had done their worst. There was nothing more they could do to the Son of God, and he took it for you and for me. Number five, his physical sufferings were finished. Number six, his life was finished. When he cried, Tetelestai, he only had a few more seconds to live. And so all that he had come to do he had fully accomplished and his life and his mission came to an end at almost the exactly the same moment I love that's true for your life as well that's true for you I love the quote by John Wesley who's the one that started the Methodist church hundreds of years ago that's around the world and John Wesley said we are immortal until our work for God is done you are immortal you can't die until your your work for God until your work for God is done. And then number seven, uh, Satan was finished. Now he's still wreaking havoc in the world, but his days are numbered. He, his, his back was basically broken at the cross. When Christ cried out, Tetelestai, it, it began numbering his days. It's kind of like the Normandy invasion during World War II. On D-Day, uh, Hitler was not completely defeated. There was still a lot of fighting left to do, a lot of heartache, a lot of bloodshed, a lot of fighting left to do between when the troops landed at Normandy at D-Day and when the fall of Berlin eventually happened uh, a, a number of months or years later. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of suffering left to be done. But basically, as soon as the Allied troops got a beachhead and established themselves on Normandy, it was all over. Of Adolf Hitler. Um, same thing is true. I remember with my dad. Um, my dad was utterly not afraid of snakes. Uh, totally not afraid of snakes. I didn't get one molecule of his DNA in, in that particular area, man. I mean, he was a forest ranger up in Northern California. He used to chase down rattlesnakes, and when they go into a hole, he'd catch them by the tail before they got in, pull them out, and snap their heads like a whip. Nothing of that was transferred to me later in life. 
And so when we'd be out in the woods together in Virginia on our farm, and we'd come across a copperhead, which was the main poison snake in Virginia, and he knew I was afraid of him, so he'd take his ax and he'd cut it in half. And then the one half would continue to jump around. So he'd cut it in a fourth, and the fourth continued to jump around. Then he'd cut the head off, and the head would still jump around. Now, if you picked up the head and held it, the fangs could still get poison into you. And when you mess around with Satan, he can still get his poison into you. You open the door in the occult. You, you, you do stuff that kind of invites him into your life. You just live a life that just kind of, kind of borrows trouble by engaging in stuff that Satan endorses. Oh, yeah. He, he's a dead serpent. I mean, he's basically dead with. But if you keep your distance and just watch the head flop around until he's dead, it's not going to poison you. But if you mess with him, it'll poison you. But basically, when Jesus cried tetelestai on the cross, Satan was finished. Paul writes, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all of his enemies beneath his feet. Tetelestai. It is finished. For our closing time of worship, I want to kind of go in a, in a different direction than I've gone to practically apply this to our lives. Uh, we're going to close with a worship song. And as we're singing, I'm going to have some of the pastors here along the front. And because the tomb is empty, and because Jesus finished what he set out to do, he is able to help us to finish what he's called us to do. And so I just want you to think about any area in your life that remains unfinished where you would like to ask God and pray that he would help you to finish that thing. I don't know what it is and I don't even know. The Holy Spirit just kind of laid this on my heart to put this out there for you. Is there, is there unfinished stuff in your life? Maybe to finish grieving for someone. Maybe finish an, a freedom from an addiction. Maybe finish healing in a particular area of life. I don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit just told me to, to pitch it this way. To just say, uh, you know, if there's anything you'd like prayer for that is unfinished, and you want to say, God, because Jesus had the power to be a finisher, and because the tomb is empty, he gives us the, he's alive today and can help us to finish unfinished business within our hearts and you just want to pray with somebody about that, then the pastor's going to be up here and we would just love to pray with you if in any way that would be an encouragement to you. So let's stand together and let's sing. And if you'd like prayer for that or anything else for that matter, uh, come on forward and the pastors would just love uh, to pray with you.